All right, so then um, this again, as you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, post in the chat or uh, speak up through your mic if you want as well. So to start off with, um, I wanted to um, just define what continuity is and just go over some of the uh, basic facts regarding continuity. And uh, before I write out the actual definition, uh, I wanted to just kind of give a graphical illustration of like what does it mean for a function to be continuous. So looking at um, this first picture here, in this picture, the graph, uh, there's no like hole or any sort of a break in the graph at this point C. And so basically, as long as your graph remains connected like this, uh, we would say that the function f is continuous uh, at that point C. Okay. So basically, to be continuous just means that there's not going to be any holes or any breaks within the graph. So then in contrast, uh, I have some pictures down here illustrating some situations where a function would not be continuous at C. And so in each of these scenarios, there's a problem, which is that um, either there's a hole in the graph or there's a break in the graph like this one, or this one as well, where you've got like a asymptote, which kind of separates the graph into two parts. Okay. So here, this is a, I think, maybe pretty simple uh, visual of what continuity is. But then we'd also want like a more precise uh, mathematical uh, definition of what does it mean for a function to be continuous. And so we can define continuity uh, in terms of limits. Um, so if we take a look at this first picture where f is continuous at this point c, This picture, if we were to consider the limit as x approaches c of this function f of x. So here, as x is approaching c, you know, regardless of whether you approach from the left or from the right, you approach the same value. And the value that you approach is just whatever the value of the function was at c. OK, uh, whereas uh, if we take a look at some of the pictures down below where uh, the function is not continuous, uh, let's look at this first picture first. So if we consider the limit as x is approaching c. So in this case, the, the limit does exist. So whatever this y value is, that would be the value of the limit. But in like this picture and this picture here. So in this picture, the value of the limit was uh, whatever the value of the function was. So the function was actually defined at this point, whereas in this picture here, the function is actually not defined at C. So while the limit exists, uh, the problem is that the function is uh, undefined at C. And so that leads to having a hole uh, in the graph, OK? And then, of course, in this second picture, you guys can kind of see what's going on. Uh, in this case, the limit from the left and from the right, uh, these limits exist, but they're not equal to each other. And so in this case, uh, since the one-sided limits are not equal to each other, as x approaches c uh, will not exist. Okay. And uh, I guess lastly in this picture, I uh, can kind of see what the problem is as well. So I guess technically, the limit from the left and the right agree with each other, but uh, the limit is uh, infinite. And again, that leads to a problem, at least uh, graphically, because um, you have a vertical asymptote, which uh, leads to a break in the graph. Okay. So in order for a function to be continuous, Whatever. 
uh, you can define continuity in terms of limits and say that f is going to be continuous at c if um, the limit as x approaches c uh, of the function is equal to the value of f at c. So that's kind of like um, one way that you can define continuity in terms of limits. And sometimes it's useful to expand this out a little bit further. So when we look at the statement, we can uh, sort of break this down into like even smaller uh, statements, if you will. So uh, this statement says a couple of things. First, it says that the limit as x approaches c, well, it can maybe even before that. First, the statement says that f has to be defined at c. It is defined, not undefined. OK. Uh, then another thing that the statement is saying is that the limit as x approaches c of the function exists, uh, which uh, in turn, for the limit to exist, that really just means that the limit from the left and the limit from the right exist in our equal to each other. And then uh, lastly, uh, the statement says that the limit then must be equal to the value of the function. Which uh, I guess I'll just write that statement down again. OK. So then when you guys are learning about continuity, uh, they usually break the definition of continuity down into these three statements. So the function has to be defined to ensure that there's like no hole, as in like this uh, scenario. Uh, limit has to exist. Uh, and then the value of the limit has to be equal to the value of the function. Okay. Uh, so then. In each of these cases below, uh, here we would see that f is uh, not continuous. At c, and uh, so some people might call c a, a discontinuity uh, of the function f. In that case. And uh, if I focus on uh, this first uh, example of discontinuity, uh, this example is like a little bit different from the other two. So in this example here, this first one, uh, this is sometimes called a Removable discontinuity. It's a removable uh, discontinuity. And the reason why uh, this is called a removable discontinuity is because, as the um, name implies, you can sort of remove this continuity. by defining your function f at c to be equal to the value of this limit. Okay. Because then if you defined f of c to be equal to l, uh, essentially you would just like fill in this hole. And that would then make the function continuous. Okay. But then uh, in these cases, then these would be like non-removable discontinuities. Okay. So then that's kind of um, giving you guys all of what it means for a function to be continuous, and then giving you the definition, and then the different types of discontinuity. Uh, before I start um, just like working on some problems, 
I also wanted to go over just a couple of basic facts about continuity, which would um, be useful to know. Oh, actually, uh, maybe before that, let me say one thing. Uh, oh, no, OK, I'll mention that later. OK. So first, I want to go over some uh, basic facts of continuity. So I guess the first thing I wanted to mention is all of the like uh, usual functions that we work with uh, tend to be continuous on their domain. OK. So here, I've kind of just listed like some of the uh, common families of functions that we deal with. So uh, constant functions just refers to like a function which is equal to a constant. So like f of x equals 1. Um, powers of x, so x, x squared. Uh, it would also include um, square roots and things like that. Um, here, just in case you guys aren't familiar with it, I thought I would write something like this out. So if you ever see something like x to the power of 3 fifths, uh, if you didn't know how to handle that, x to a power of 3 fifths is the same as the fifth root of x cubed. And it's also the same as the fifth root of x cubed. So just if you ever see that expression, that's how you could uh, evaluate it. Uh, of course, this also includes uh, negative powers of x as well. It's x to the negative 1. If you guys remember, that's the same as uh, 1 over x. Uh, other common functions that we deal with are exponentials. So b to the x. Um, and then, of course, we work with e to the x in particular most often. Uh, logarithms, so log with any base b. Uh, we usually work with uh, the natural log, which is log with a base of e. All the trig functions and the inverse trig functions as well. Uh, all of these functions are continuous, uh, at least at every point in their domain. Okay. Um, so then, like for instance, like this function one over x, uh, its domain is um, all real numbers except x equals zero because when x is 0, uh, you'd be dividing by 0, which would make it undefined. So like, for instance, I'm saying this function would be continuous at every point, uh, except at x equals 0, OK? OK, so that's kind of the first thing I want to mention. All the functions that you're familiar with uh, are continuous uh, on their domain. Okay. Uh, the next thing that I thought was worth mentioning, so uh, if you have two functions, f and g, and let's say both of those functions are continuous at a point c, then if you add the functions or subtract them or multiply them or divide them, the result will still be continuous at c. Um, there's a slight caveat for when you're dividing the two functions, which is that uh, we would need to assume that g is not equal to 0 at c, because uh, otherwise it would be undefined. Okay. So what that means is you can take any of the functions up here, and you can create more complex functions by adding them together, multiplying them together, things like that. And then the result will still be continuous. So for example, then all polynomials are continuous. Because okay. a polynomial is just like a sum of a bunch of like powers of x, basically. So, And then uh, expression like this would also be continuous as well. Uh, at least it would be continuous wherever it was defined. Okay. Uh, there's also one more property that I thought was worth mentioning. Uh, so this last one, basically, the property is that a, a composition of continuous functions is continuous. Uh, but more precisely, uh, the statement would read as, uh, if g is continuous at point C, 
And then if f is continuous at g of c, then we would say that uh, f is continuous at c. And uh, you guys, um, maybe you guys don't remember what function composition was, but uh, f composed with g of x is f of g of x. So I don't know if you guys remember that or not. So yes, yeah, so a composition of continuous functions is also continuous. So then uh, that means expressions like this uh, are going to be continuous as well. So like uh, as an example, if we take a look at this uh, first function e to the x squared minus 3. So this is a composition of the exponential e to the x and the polynomial uh, x squared minus 3. So then um, f of g would be e to the x squared minus 3. Okay. And then uh, likewise, this is like a composition of well, maybe quite a few functions. So the innermost function, I guess, would be like the q root function. Uh, and then you've got a secant function. It's kind of in the middle. And then the outermost function is really the squared function. So if you did like g of h of x, you know, that would give you like secant of the t root of x plus 1. And then if you put all of that into f, then into f would just square all of it. So that's how you get like a secant squared. Okay. So, uh, you know, all these functions were continuous. So when you compose all of them together, the result is still continuous. I'm not going to do this last one, but uh, again, if you see like an expression like this, this is just um, built off of compositions uh, and like. Um, multiplications and things like that um, from continuous functions. So therefore, um, something like this would be continuous as well, OK? So generally, most of the functions that you'll be working with uh, in your calculus courses are going to be continuous um, on their domain. So if we want to see some uh, examples of functions that are not continuous, Uh, the easiest way to come up with a function that's not continuous is to um, come up with a piecewise defined function. And so I'll talk about what a piecewise defined function is next. You guys have already seen an example of a piecewise defined function. Uh, yeah, so um, I'll do what I did. Um, So when we upload the recording to YouTube and I can the link to my OneNote um, in the video description, that way you guys would know what OK. So the absolute value function, uh, so uh, we kind of went over it yesterday, but Absolute value of x is defined to be equal to x if like x is non-negative. But if x is negative, then um, you want to say that absolute value of x is equal to negative x instead. So that way, if x is negative, the negative in front would then uh, make it positive. Okay. 
So we call this a piecewise defined function simply because uh, the function is defined like in pieces, like literally, if you will. So it's, uh, there's like um, one definition when x is non-negative, and then another definition when x is um, uh, negative. Okay. Uh, do you guys remember what the graph of the absolute value function looked like? Okay, well, uh, if you guys don't remember what the graph looked like, yeah, so it kind of had the shape of a V, and you yeah, had the top turn at the origin. So, like when x is greater than or equal to zero, uh, the graph should uh, look like the line uh, y because uh, the function is found to be x when x is greater than or equal to zero. But then when x is um, less than or equal to zero, the graph of the absolute value function should be uh, the line y equals negative x instead. Okay. So then put the two of them together, and that gives you the graph of the uh, absolute value function. Okay. All right. Now, in this case, um, the absolute value function, you may notice that it is continuous. Okay. Um, just you know, looking at the graph, there's no breaks in the graph anywhere. Uh, there's no holes or asymptotes or anything like that. Okay. So absolute value is actually also a continuous function. Uh, but if we have like a more complicated piece by defined function, then uh, there's going to be a possibility that it's no longer continuous. So that's kind of like my first example. Uh, here I created um, an example of another piecewise defined function, uh, much more complicated than the absolute value function. Okay. All right. So what I want to do with this uh, problem is I want to determine um, where is this function continuous, uh, where is it not continuous. And usually when you're working with a piecewise defined function, you check for the uh, discontinuities. Uh, usually you want to check uh, at the x values where your function is like changing its definition. So in this example, uh, the formula for f of x changes uh, when x is negative 1. So it changes from this to this. And then um, at x equals 2, there's like another change where uh, after x equals 2, the formula for f of x changes to uh, this one down here. So usually at those points where your function is like transitioning to the next piece, uh, those are going to be the points where um, there's going to be like a possible discontinuity. So you'll want to analyze those in particular. So we're going to have to um, take a look at those two points in particular. But uh, let's maybe uh, think about um, the other x values uh, before we look at these two. Okay. So if x is smaller than negative 1, um, so our function is just going to be equal to sine of x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. And uh, this is just a, a composition and like a division of continuous functions. And so as I talked about uh, uh, earlier just now, when you have something like that, that's just like a composition or just some uh, algebraic combination of continuous functions, the result is still going to be continuous. So we could say that f is uh, continuous at every point uh, less than negative 1. Okay. And if we check like for x values between negative 1 and 2, 
but not including them for now because we need to analyze those uh, separately. Uh, again, this simple idea in this case, F is like just a polynomial. So polynomials are always continuous as well. And then the last expression when X is strictly greater than two. Okay. Uh, it's a pretty complicated expression, but uh, again, we talked about how you know, square roots are continuous, polynomials are continuous. If you uh, divide two continuous functions, the result is still going to be continuous. So uh, even though it looks pretty complicated, you can still uh, pretty safely say that uh, this function is going to be continuous as well. So you usually don't need to do much work to check for where the function is continuous. Uh, it usually just follows from those like basic facts about continuity that I mentioned. So then for a problem like this, um, the real work comes in analyzing uh, what's happening when x is negative 1 and what's happening when x is equal to 2. All right, so to check if this function is to be uh, continuous or not at x equals negative 1. Let's uh, start with that first. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to check like the three uh, conditions that are required for a function to be continuous. Uh, and I'll just reference them again real quick. So I mentioned them at the very beginning. But for continuity, uh, I want to check if uh, these three conditions are satisfied. So is the function defined at the point? Does the limit at that point exist? And then is that limit equal to the value of the function at that point? Okay. Okay, so let's try to apply that to this problem here. Uh, so checking is um, f continuous at um, x equals negative 1. So first, uh, is the function f defined at negative 1? OK. So if we look at this formula for the function f of x, Could someone tell me what the value of f at negative 1 would be equal to? Or if it's not defined, um, you can also say that's just undefined. All right. Um, yeah, so that is correct. Uh, to see why um, f at negative 1 is equal to negative 2. So at x equals negative 1, um, your function is going to be equal to 3x plus 1, okay, because uh, this interval includes x equals negative 1 in it. So we're going to the 3x plus 1 definition of f. And then you would plug in negative 1 for x. And so yeah, you would get negative 2 for the value of f. Okay. So it comes from just plugging negative 1 into this formula. And we're using this formula uh, because um, this, yeah, because um, this formula for f applies in this interval, which includes where x is uh, equal to negative 1, OK? Now, for the next part where we're checking, uh, does the limit exist? Okay. So to check if the limit exists, because your function is defined piecewise, uh, what you're going to want to do is um, take the limit as x approaches from the left, and then take the limit as x approaches from the right. Okay. So do each of the one-sided limits, and then you can check if those were equal to each other.
So let's start by looking at the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left. Let's see if this limit exists or not. Okay. OK, now if x is approaching negative 1 from the left, okay, um, that means that x is going to be less than negative 1. And so if x is less than negative 1, uh, that means that our function is going to be equal to this uh, function up here, OK? So therefore, in the limit, uh, we would use this first definition of the function, OK? And then uh, later, when we look at the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right, uh, essentially what would happen is we would need to use the second definition to evaluate that limit. Because uh, for that one, if x is approaching negative 1 from the right, uh, that means x would be larger than negative 1, which means you'd have to switch uh, to this definition of f instead. So we'll do that um, after we finish this limit. OK, so uh, does anyone have an idea of um, how you would try to evaluate this limit? <laughs> yeah, so does anyone have any like suggestions on what I should do for this? Oh, hmm. Do we need to squeeze it? That's actually a good uh, idea. Um, we'll sort of squeeze it, I guess, but not really. Um, so um, let's talk about how we would handle this limit here. Um, if you try to plug in a negative 1 for x, um, I'll just do it down here, I suppose. So if you plug in negative 1 for x, negative 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. In the denominator, you'd have negative 1 plus 1. And sine of 0 is 0. So this is like one of those um, uh, indeterminate forms. Okay. But uh, we uh, went over a special trig limit involving sine. So as sort of a reminder, uh, yesterday we saw that this limit as uh, theta approaches 0, a sign of theta over theta, that this limit is equal to 1. And so the idea is to try and use this idea from this special trig limit. Uh, to evaluate the limit that we have up here, OK? So we have a similar situation where uh, the expression inside the sign is approaching 0, and that the denominator is also approaching 0, as we have in the special trig limit. But in order to apply the special trig limit, the denominator has to match the inside of the sign uh, exactly, OK? And right now, that's not quite the case with us. The denominator is not matching with the uh, inside of the sine function. So we want to do something to this limit uh, so that the denominator will match what we have inside of the sine function. So I don't know if anyone has a suggestion on what we could do so that the denominator will match what we have inside of the sine function. Yeah, OK. So that's a good observation. So um, x squared minus 1 <laughs> is a difference of squares. So that means that um, you can factor it. <clears throat>
And in particular, x squared minus 1 will factor as x minus 1 uh, times x plus 1. Okay. So in order to get the denominator to match the inside of the line, what we might consider doing is we might consider multiplying the denominator by x minus 1. So if we did that, uh, x plus 1 times x minus 1 would give us an x squared minus 1. Okay. But you can't just multiply the denominator by x minus 1, so we'd also need to multiply the numerator by x minus 1 as well. So then what that will leave us with is we'll have sine of x squared minus 1 over. We'll multiply the x plus 1 and the x minus 1 to get x squared minus 1 in the denominator. And then we are still multiplying by x minus 1 as well. Um, but I'll go ahead and keep that kind of separate from um, everything else. OK. So then here, uh, as x is approaching negative 1, we can say that this first part will approach 1 in the limit. And um, the reason why I can say it approaches 1 the limit is because we're using the um, special trig limit that we have down here to make that conclusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, OK. I guess that is a good question. So um, here what's happening is um, so x is not approaching 0. It is approaching negative 1. But what's more important is that not what x is approaching, but what's more important is that the inside of the sine function and the denominator, that those are approaching 0. So x is approaching negative 1, but x squared minus 1 would be approaching 0 in that case. Because uh, if you plug in negative 1 for x, it would just be 0. So as long as the inside of the sign and the denominator, as long as those are approaching 0, uh, you can apply the strict limit. Okay. All right. And then I went ahead and kind of finished it out. So this became 1 in the limit. And then for x minus 1, we just plug in negative 1 for x. And so we got that the limit was as x approaches negative 1 from the left is equal to negative 2, OK? All right, now, uh, what we also want to do is uh, take a look at the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right as well. And this one's a, a lot easier. So if we're doing the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right, I mentioned it earlier, but x would be larger than negative 1. So for f of x, we want to use this formula for f of x now. OK? So doing the limit from the uh, right. Um, f of x would be equal to 3x plus 1. And so we would just plug in negative 1 uh, for x, and we get negative 3 plus 1, which is negative 2. Okay. And so the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left, and the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right, uh, we see that both of those were equal to negative 2. And so because both of these limits are equal, that means that uh, the actual limit as x approaches negative 1 does exist, and we can it was equal to negative 2. Okay. 
So we have that the limit exists as x approaches negative 1. And then um, f at negative 1 was defined, and that was equal to negative 2. So then for uh, continuity, third condition that we wanted to check was that the limit as x approaches negative 1 for continuity, remember that this limit needs to be equal to the value of your function um, at negative 1 in this case. And uh, we kind of verified that um, both sides are equal to each other because f at negative 1 was equal to negative 2. And after doing both the limit left and the right, we saw that the limit was equal to negative 2 as well. So both sides are the same. Okay. So because all three of these conditions are satisfied, uh, we can conclude that the function f is continuous uh, at x equals negative 1. Okay. Now, there's still one other point that uh, needs to be considered, which is um, x equals 2. Because again, at x equals 2, your function changes definitions. And when that happens, there's a possible, um, that could be a discontinuity. So you want to analyze that. So uh, we'll do something similar. Uh, what we want to do is um, take a look at the limit from the left and the right as x is approaching 2. OK. And let's see here. I'll try to do that off to the side instead. OK. Now first, uh, maybe before we start taking some limits, um, let's just check first if f of 2 is defined. Okay. So um, f of 2 is defined. So if we want to evaluate a function at x equals 2, uh, x equals 2 falls into the middle interval. You'd be plugging in 2 uh, for x into the middle formula. So 3 times 2 plus 1. So that's going to be 7. Uh, after that, we want to check the limit as x approaches 2. Okay. Uh, but again, to check the limit as x approaches 2, we'll need to consider the limit from the left and the right separately, uh, since the function is defined uh, differently on each side. So if we look at the limit as x approaches 2 from the left, Approaching 2 from the left, um, you would use the middle definition because x would be less than 2 in that case. And I'm just going to give the same answer as 7. If we take a look at the limit as x approaches 2 but from the right, Then this time we're going to use the last uh, formula for f, because now x is approaching 2 from the right, so x is going to be larger than 2. So then if we take a look at this limit here, uh, as x is approaching 2, <clears throat> uh, if you try to plug in 2 for x, um, I won't work it out, but you should find that you'll get a 0 over 0 if you try to plug in 2 for x. So therefore, we have to uh, do some kind of a trick to uh, evaluate this limit. So does anyone remember what the trick was uh, when you had a square root in a 0 over 0 situation for limits? Uh, not reciprocals. Um, you might just be misremembering what the word was, though. 
OK. Yeah, so there's a trick to uh, multiply uh, numerator and denominator by the conjugate. So in this case, the conjugate of the numerator would just be the square root and then plus 3 instead. But you have to multiply both the numerator and the denominator to make sure that you're not changing your problem. OK. So the numerator, when you multiply by the conjugates, you're going to get like a squared, which would just get rid of the square root. And then you're going to get minus b squared, so minus 9. Yeah, in the denominator, we're going to go ahead and factor this polynomial because we know that at some point we want to uh, try and cancel something out in order to evaluate the limit. Okay. So x squared minus 3x minus 2. Uh, to factor that, it should be uh, x minus 1 x minus 2, OK? All right, and in the numerator, uh, let's simplify the numerator and try to factor it as well. Okay, so this is uh, 2x squared minus 8. And you can factor out a 2 first. And then x squared minus 4, you can factor as uh, x minus 2 times x plus 2. Okay. All right, so then the numerator factored is 2 times x minus 2 times x plus 2. And you can cancel the x minus 2s now. Okay. And then now that we've canceled, we can try to plug in 2 for x. And if we do that, we're going to get uh, 2 plus 2 is 4 times 2 is 8 in the numerator. In the denominator, uh, 2 minus 1 is 1. This is going to be square root of 9 is 3 plus 3 is 8 over 6, which is a 4 over 3, OK? So in this case, what's happening is the limit from the left and from the right. Uh, this time we see that these limits are actually not equal to each other. Not equal. And so because these limits are not equal to each other, uh, that means that the limit as x approaches 2 does not exist. And because this limit does not exist, uh, that would tell us that f is continuous. at x equals 2. OK? So this function, it was uh, almost continuous everywhere. There's just one point where it's not continuous, which would be um, at x equals 2. OK. All right, so then um, whenever you have a piecewise defined function like this and you're checking if it's continuous or not, you'll want to pay attention to uh, the x values where it changes its definition. And you do uh, the limit as x approaches from the left and the right separately. Okay.
All right, um, any questions about any of that so far? Okay. So I'll get on with the next topic. It's the intermediate value theorem. Okay. So here I've written out a statement of the intermediate value theorem. So it says if you have a function which is continuous on a closed interval from A to B, then for any number y between f of a and f of b, uh, there's going to be a number x between a and b uh, such that f of x is equal to y. Okay. So that might be a little bit hard to read, but if I draw a picture, it'll probably make uh, a lot more sense. Okay, so let's suppose um, the closed interval AB is here on the x-axis. Okay. And let's say maybe um, F of A was up here. And just maybe as an example, F of B happens to be down here. That's F of B. Okay, and then the number of y between f of a and f of b. Uh, so let's say um, we have this number here, which is y. Okay. Now, because the function f is continuous uh, on this closed interval, that means there's not going to be any holes or any uh, breaks uh, in this graph. So in order to connect from um, the point to this point here at the end. Uh, at some point, your function will have to uh, cross this y value. And so at that point where it crosses the y value, um, you're going to have an x coordinate corresponding to that point. So for this x value, uh, the function evaluated at x would be equal to y. Okay. And that's the statement of the intermediate value theorem. Okay. Now, if your function was not continuous, then uh, the intermediate value theorem uh, might not hold anymore if it were not continuous. The reason for that, I could kind of draw a picture to indicate what would uh, happen. So if your function is not continuous, then basically your function could sort of uh, skip the y value uh, as it goes from A to B. And then in a picture like this, there would then not be any x value for which uh, f of x equals y, OK? So if it's not continuous, this intermediate value theorem um, could fail. OK. So I'll do just sort of like one quick question on the intermediate value theorem. So first, the intermediate value theorem, uh, it's sometimes formulated uh, a little bit differently. So here I've given um, just like another way of stating the intermediate value theorem. So what this theorem is saying is, um, again, you have a function continuous on the closed interval from A to B. And this time, uh, we assume that f of A 
times f of b is negative. So what this condition means, essentially means that f of a and f of b should have opposite sign. So one of them should be positive and the other should be negative. So in this case, um, this formulation of the intermediate value theorem says that the function f is going to have a zero uh, between a and b. And so to see why that would be the case, um, just draw a picture of that here. So it's kind of the same idea. If your function f is continuous, then to get from this point to this point, it has to cross the x-axis at some point. So where it crosses the x-axis, uh, that would be a point where the function has a zero, OK? Now, I'll also make a quick comment, which is, as you can see in the picture, um, your function could actually have uh, multiple zeros in the interval. Uh, the intermediate value theorem doesn't say anything about how many zeros it may have, but it will guarantee that there is at least one zero uh, in the interval. Okay. So then, just as like um, a quick uh, example. Here I've got this problem, which is to prove that this equation has at least one real solution. Okay. So ordinarily, when you're solving an equation, at least with polynomials, you try to factor them. But since this is not like a simple quadratic, uh, it's not something that we can uh, easily factor. Uh, so even though we can't factor it, we can still uh, try to show that there is at least a solution uh, using the intermediate value theorem. So what we would want to do is, um, first we have this function this polynomial function, which I'll call f of x. And polynomials, we know, are uh, always continuous. Okay. So we want to note that the function is continuous, because you can't apply the intermediate value theorem if it's uh, not continuous. Okay. But in order to establish the existence of a zero, I would also want to find an interval a, b, uh, one where f of a and f of b have opposite sign. So to do that, you can just sort of like pick some numbers and plug them into the function. Uh, you have a lot of freedom for how to do that part. I would just stick with some simple numbers. So uh, zero is a pretty simple number to work with. So let me just try plugging in zero for x. So here, if I plug in zero for x, um, you can see that f of zero would be equal to one. So we have um, one point where the function is positive right now. What I want to do next is find a point where the function is going to be negative instead, because I want to make sure that I have two points where the function has opposite sign. So just pick another number, plug it into the function. Uh, don't, doesn't have to be too crazy. Uh, but ideally, the answer is going to come out negative. So. Let's just try another easy number to plug in. Let's plug in 1 for x. So if I plug in 1 for x, I'm going to get 1 uh, minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 
plus 5 minus 6, OK? So we plug in 1 for x. And then if you add all this up, you can see the answer is going to be negative 3. So now we have a point where the function is negative, OK? So we know that the function f is continuous. And then that at 0 and at 1, uh, the function has an uh, opposite sign. Okay. So then we can apply the intermediate value theorem. And we can see that this function f has at least one. Zero, okay. And we can be a little bit more specific because the intermediate value theorem guarantees that there's going to be a zero uh, inside of the uh, open interval AB. And in this case, um, just with the numbers that we ended up choosing, uh, we could say that I don't have at least one zero in the open interval uh, from zero to one, okay. So um, do you guys have any questions? So I'll just kind of quickly go over this. We'll do one quick example, and then I'm going to hand it over to Les. OK? So I want to go over just like one final sort of application of uh, continuity. All right. Let me see here. OK. So um, here I've got um, part of a picture drawn out. So uh, let's suppose that we have a function f, which is continuous. And let's suppose that the zeros of f are at these three points, at a, b, and c. And uh, what I want to talk about is uh, I want to talk about what's going on uh, in between a, B, and C. OK, so let's think about um, what is a function doing uh, between uh, A and B, OK? So what I want to, um, what I want everyone to kind of note is that the function f, since it's continuous, it has to be uh, either always positive, uh, or it has to be always negative uh, in between uh, each of its zeros. Okay. And so to understand why that's the case, uh, let's suppose that uh, in B, let's suppose that your function um, was like both positive and negative uh, in that interval. So if your function changes the sign the interval by the intermediate value theorem, because your function is continuous, um, OK. Because your function is continuous, it would have to cross the x-axis. So you'd have to have like a 0 in between a and b if that were the case. But here, what I'm saying is that a, b, and c were the um, uh, were the zeros of f. So the, I'm saying that f would wouldn't have any other zeros aside from a, b, and c. Okay. So if a, b, and c are the only zeros of f, then this should not be possible. So therefore, either your function was always positive. Uh, or instead, uh, your function might have been always negative. Okay, but it couldn't have crossed the x-axis uh, if it didn't have any other zeros. Okay, uh, same logic would apply like in any of the other intervals between b and c. It would also apply to um, after c as well. 
your function either has to be like always positive at this point, uh, or it has to be always negative, uh, because uh, otherwise it would have another zero, uh, but we're saying that it doesn't have any zeros other than a, b, and c. Okay. So this is kind of like a useful fact for uh, checking for where a function is positive, where is a function negative. Okay. Uh, I'll also note that, um, let's say if your function had like an asymptote or something like that at some point, uh, in that case then what might happen is your function uh, could change sign, maybe from like positive to negative at the asymptote. So in addition to looking for where your function is zero, uh, you also just want to check for where your function might be undefined when you're trying to determine where it's a positive or a negative, okay? So I'm just going to do um, a quick example of checking where a function is positive or negative. Uh, first, I kind of outlined like what your strategy would be for such a problem. Uh, you want to find what the domain of f is, check for where it might be undefined. So you'll find where the zeros of the function are. Okay. So then the zeros of f will divide the domain into separate intervals. And uh, as I talked about, your function is going to be either always positive or always negative on each of those intervals. So determine if it's positive or negative. Uh, what you can do is choose a test point in each of those intervals, plug that point into the function, and that way you can determine if your function was either positive or negative. Okay. And I'll illustrate that process with just uh, one example here. And so I just want to do one example. Um, I think I'll do this example down here. Okay, okay so uh, the first thing I'd probably want to do with this function, uh, checking where it's positive or negative, uh, I would try to factor the numerator as well as the denominator. So the numerator, if we were to factor it, it would factor as x minus 1 times x minus 4. The denominator is going to factor as x plus 3 all squared, OK? All right, so uh, the function is going to be undefined when x is negative 3. So uh, you'd be going by 0 at that point. And we also want to check where the function um, has any zeros. and from the numerator, now that we've it, I can see that uh, f is going to be equal to 0 at uh, x equals 1 and x equals 4. OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw just a little picture. And so let's see, the function we know is undefined at negative 3. And then it has zeros at 1 and at 4. Okay. OK, so then um, the zeros and the points where the function is undefined, uh, that separates the domain into um, a couple different intervals. So you have the interval from negative infinity to negative 3. We've got another interval from negative 3 to 1, 1 to 4, and then 4 to infinity. So on each of these intervals, the function is going to be either always positive or always negative. And so to determine whether it's positive or negative, we're going to pick a point in each of these intervals. So we're just going to pick any number in between negative 3, 1, and 4. And then also we'll pick a number after 4 
and before negative three. Okay. So um, we're going to take these points and we're just going to plug them into our function uh, just to check and see uh, if the function was uh, positive or negative. So we'll start by negative four uh, into the function. And it's probably easiest to use the factored form. So if you plug in negative four, you'll get negative five times negative eight over negative one squared. So uh, altogether, that's going to be positive. So I'm just going to make a note. Uh, your function is going to be positive between uh, negative infinity to negative three. And then let's plug zero into the function next. We plug in zero into the function, uh, negative one times negative four. And the denominator is always positive because it's getting squared. So altogether, this is still positive. So the function must be positive between negative three and one. And if we take the next test point uh, two, plug it into the function. Uh, two minus one is one, two minus four is negative two, and two minus three is five. So this time the function is going to be negative overall. So on the from one to four, the function must be negative. And then lastly, if we plug in five for x, uh, five minus one is four, uh, five minus four is one, and then five plus three is eight. But we can see everything is positive. Okay, so then um, based off the sort of sign chart that we created here, uh, we can see that the function f is positive. Uh, so it's positive on the interval from minus infinity to minus 3. Uh, it's not positive at negative 3 because it's uh, undefined there. Uh, but then we can say it's positive from negative 3 to 1. Uh, I'll leave one out of the interval because at x equals one, it's not positive, but rather it's equal to zero, which is not positive. And then lastly, the function is going to be positive again on the interval from four to infinity. Again, I'm using an open interval because uh, at four, the function is not positive, but rather it was equal to zero. And then lastly, um, you can see that the function was negative uh, only between 1 and 4. OK? All right, so I think I've taken up uh, enough time. So with uh, the little time that we have remaining, I think I'll go ahead and hand it over to Les. You can go ahead and at least uh, get started on covering Oh, derivatives. All right, check one, two, one second. Uh, all right, thanks, Elliot. Uh, so we're going to look at applications of limits. Uh, yeah, Les, uh, your mic appears to be muted now. So I'm not sure what happened. OK, check one, two. All right, is that better? Yeah, I can hear now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I just uh, put my elbow on a wire or something. So, okay. Um, so, of course, to get an equation of a line, we need two pieces of information. Uh, we need a, a point. So, suppose we have uh, x value of a and we plug it into our function. So, this is, it represents the graph of some function that we're dealing with. And we plug that into our function to get f at a. So this point on the graph of the function is has an x-coordinate of a and a y-coordinate of f at a. Okay. 
And uh, another piece of information that we're going to need to get an equation of this tangent line is a slope, right? So what is the slope of this tangent line? Okay. So those are the two questions we want to uh, answer. Uh, so we'll use the point slope form of a line. And all the work will really go into finding the slope of that tangent line. Because for that, we're going to need uh, calculus. So uh, let's write down the point-slope form of a line. Let's see. Right, so here the specific point on the line uh, is exactly the point that the line shares with the graph of the function, the point of tangency. So that's going to be A and F at A. Uh, but the question is, what is the slope, right? Now, the problem with uh, the slope here is that uh, we only have, we only know one point that goes through the line. And, you know, knowing one point is not enough to define a slope, right, to define a line. So we're going to use some, uh, you know, that idea of calculus, where we're going to use a simple object, geometric object. So we're going to use a line whose slope we can define. Okay. So this green line is a, called a secant line. It's going to go through two points of the graph of our function. And suppose that this other point, we use uh, x, right? and we plug that into our function, and then we get f of x. So this other point on the graph has x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. Okay. But now that we have two distinct points, we know that we can define uh, we can define a slope of that line, the slope of the secant line. Okay, so we know the slope of the secant line is uh, roughly speaking, right? Well, not roughly speaking. It's a uh, the change in y values or the change in the x values. So the change in the y values here is going to be uh, the difference here between the function at x and the function at a. And then divide that by the change in the x values. So that's going to be the difference between x and a. And you may be seeing this in pre-calculus. Does anybody recall what this is called? Uh, from pre-calculus, this formula. Okay. All right. Uh, it's... Hey, can, can anybody hear me? Oh, uh, thank you. All right. I'm just going to share my entire screen. I'm having trouble. Okay. All right. There we go. So I apologize for that. So this is a... a in pre-calculus, maybe they introduced this formula as uh, the difference quotient. It's just the slope of a line through two points on a graph of a function. Okay, so we said that calculus is, you know, simple objects or formulas, geometric objects, followed by a limiting process. So if we want to 
define the uh, slope of this tangent line that we're after. I'll write it. I'll sh highlight it in red. What is the limiting process that you think that we can do? If we have an, you know, a well-defined formula for the slope of the green line, what kind of limiting process can we do to get to define the slope of that tangent line? Okay, so All right, here's a hint, uh, I guess. Uh, imagine picking yet another point on the graph that's closer to uh, our point uh, A, F of A. Yeah. So the idea is that we're going to let X approach A, right? And then we get this kind of con continuum of different secant lines. And even though the slope of the tangent line is not defined using just basic geometry, right? It will be defined in the limit as X approaches A. Okay. So we can define the slope of this tangent line as simply a limit of the slopes of the secant lines. So we're gonna find the limit as X approaches A. And I, and I could have let X be on the other side of A. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, So, and we're, then we're, we're going to call the slope of the tangent line of our function at A, we're going to call that F prime at A, okay? So here we have come across the definition of the derivative of our function at X equals A, okay? Uh, we call that F prime, right, at A, the little dash there is the prime okay and so geometrically uh when we look at a graph we know that this derivative of the function at a gives us the slope of the tangent line to the graph of our function okay so we're going to actually put this in action, right? We'll look at a, one of the uh, basic examples. We'll look at finding the equation of the tangent line to the graph, or a tangent line, um, or the, the tangent line of the, the graph of this function at x equals 2. So it's not drawn to scale. But of course, here's a graph of our parabola. And let's say, okay, this is 2. And I know it doesn't look right. But when you plug it into the function, we should get uh, f of 2 is 4. So this point is 2, 4. That's a point on the graph of our function. Okay, so now we're going to grab uh, another point, x. plug it into our function to get the function at x. And of course, that's just x squared. So this point, the green point here is x, x squared. All right. And uh, so now we have a point. Uh, if we look at the point slope form of a line, our specific point it's just 2, 4. And the slope we're going to find, the slope of our tangent line, by finding a limit as x approaches 2 from either side, even though I drew it on just one side, of the difference quotient. So the, the, uh, the, the limit of the slope of these secant lines as x approaches 2. So here we have the change in the values of the function, so that's going to be the function at x minus the function at 2. And then divide by the change in the values of x, so that's that distance is x minus 2. Okay. And now, of course, if we try to evaluate directly, uh, we get 0 over 0. 
so we're going to have to do some algebra. And this is where you put in practice all the kind of algebra tools that we studied, um, the first two days of this camp. So the numerator is x squared minus 2 squared, so difference of squares. We factor that into a product of conjugates, uh, cancel, and evaluate. So here, uh, when x goes to 2, x plus 2 goes to 4. OK. So now we have our point, right? And we have the uh, slope of the tangent line. So now we can just put it together. Uh, y minus the uh, y coordinate equals slope. And then x minus the x coordinate of that specific point of tangency. And if we, if we want to, we can, of course, rearrange this. Okay. So the uh, tangent line, if we guess, right, is pretty steep has a slope of 4. And we kind of see that the, if we extend that line, the y-intercept might be negative 4. So it doesn't seem obviously wrong. It's correct. OK. So that's, a, uh, that's a, uh, an example of using uh, limits to compute a derivative, right? Of course, we didn't, we're not always going to use the uh, limit definition of a derivative here. Uh, we do have some rules for finding derivatives of common functions because uh, this limiting process is kind of, uh, well, intensive. And we can also uh, maybe just look at a different way of looking at the derivative by, or a, a, a different form of the derivative. Oh, okay. So we're going to try to find the derivative of our function. So here we're just looking for the slope, if you will, the slope of tangent lines at an arbitrary value of x. Okay. So this again would be our point x, f of x. But this time, when we uh, pick a point near x, we can't call it x, obviously, but we can say it's like x plus some change, right? Plus some h, uh, h being, it could be positive or negative, h just a, one conventional way of denoting the change in x. So x plus this displacement h gives you, gets you to a new point on the x-axis, x plus h. And we would plug that into our function. And we get some point uh, x plus h, and then the function at x plus h. Uh, yeah. OK. All right, so now if we want to define the slope of our function as uh, a function in terms of, let me put it that way, in terms of x, okay, we would say that that's f prime at x. And we're going to define this as a limit. But uh, it's still the limit uh, of a difference quotient. So this time, the change in the y values would be the function at x plus some change, we're calling h, minus the function at x. And then we divide by the change in x. So that would be one x value minus the other. And obviously, that should just give us h. And this time, we're not letting x go to 0, but rather, what would bring, uh, what quantity has to go to 0 here, right, for the green point to approach the red point? 
right? Well, we must make h smaller, right? So h will go to zero. So, okay. Of course, the x's and the denominators canceled. Okay, so here uh, we have, uh, if you'd like, two different ways of uh, two different but equivalent formulas for finding the derivative of a function at a. Uh, one is where we have the difference quotient written this way, f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a, and then we let x go to a, so the denominator goes to zero. And the uh, other way is to take the limit as h goes to zero, and we write the difference quotient like so. where h denotes the change in x. Okay. So we can use this to, given our, quadra, uh, our basic parabola, to define the slope of our tangent lines as a function of x. And to, we're going to use the second formulation, let h go to 0. And then here we have the change in the y values as we go from the function at x to the function at x plus some change, h. And you divide by the change in uh, x, so h. Um, so now we plug in the particulars. Uh, well, if the function at x is x squared, then the function when the argument happens to be the expression x plus h would just be that expression squared, yeah, the argument squared. All right. And um, the, the here, uh, again, if you try to evaluate directly, which is always kind of keep that in the back of your mind that you... You know, sometimes they'll give you a limit where uh, you can just evaluate directly, but it's a good practice just to, you know, as a side note, try to evaluate directly. As h goes to 0, you're going to get x squared minus x squared on top divided by 0 on bottom. So that's indeterminate, so we do have to do some algebra. And here we're just going to do the obvious algebra of foiling, uh, x plus h squared. And then minus x squared. Right, so now here when you use limits to find derivatives, so that's a special application of limits, uh, what will often happen uh, is that stuff that doesn't involve an h will cancel out on the numerator. That's always a good sign. It doesn't always happen. Okay. So here the x squared minus x squared went to 0. And so we're left with these two terms both of which have an h in them. So h is a common factor, which we can factor out. And conveniently, right, it's that, uh, that h going to 0 on the denominator, which gives us really indeterminate form. But now that h cancels with h, gives us h divided by h is 1. So now we can easily evaluate this limit. And as and notice here, it's h that's doing the going, right? x is fixed. So h goes to 0, x is like a constant, so 2x. So uh, there you go. If you haven't seen a derivative, if your function is x squared, we've just proven that the derivative, or f prime at x, is 2 times x. Okay. And if you've seen this before, I'm pretty sure it's boring. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, so I was going to do an approximation um, because we said derivatives give you linear approximations, and I was going to approximate something that's not very exciting, like square root of 4.1. Let's go ahead and do that. So we have time. Okay. All right, so we're going to use a linear approximation to approximate the square root of 4.1. Not very exciting. And we're going to use uh, the function 
square root of x, obviously, uh, at x equals 4. And I guess I won't draw this to scale again. So when x is 4, square root of 4 is 2. And then we're going to take a point that's nearby. Uh, let's call it x. Okay, so the coordinates of the green point on our graph would be x, and then square root of x for the y coordinate. Okay, so now we're going to write down the equation of the, or, or sorry, the. Uh, I mean, because we we need a a line, right? I mean, because we're using using a linear approximation, so we're going to use the point slope a point slope form of the line. Okay. The point is just the point of tangency, so that's the point four two. The slope will be well. We'll use a limit to find that slope, right? So it's going to be a limit of the slope of this secant line in green, so it's the change in the values of y, square root of x minus 2, divided by the change in the values of x. And we're going to let x go to 4, so that our secant line at the limit becomes the tangent line. Okay. So uh, here, again, if we evaluate directly, we get uh, 0 over 0, indeterminate. So we'll use the, some algebra, and here we have conjugates. <clears throat> um, so you can either think of the x minus 2 as a difference of two numbers squared, uh, or you can just multiply by the conjugate to get rid of that pesky square root on top. So we'll do that. So again, to get rid of the pesky square root, we're just going to multiply by the conjugate on top and bottom. Uh, multiplying conjugates uh, gives you a difference of square, so square root of x squared minus 2 squared. Uh, I did something wrong, didn't I? Oh, okay. Sorry, when I wrote down the, uh, the difference in the, uh, the change in the x values, I highlight, I'll highlight it here. It should have been x minus 4, not x minus 2. So I'm going to correct that. Okay. Okay. So as we see, we have x minus 4 divided by x minus 4 is going to be 1. And now we can evaluate directly as x goes to 4, square root of x, or square root of 4 will become 2. So you get the slope is a quarter. So now we have a point and a slope for our tangent line. Slope gotten by using a limiting process. So now we can say that y minus 2 is the same, is equal to 1 fourth and x minus 4. Rearranging this, maybe writing this in slope-intercept form. Um, we get that line. So that feels about right. Uh, I mean, I didn't do it to scale, so... Okay. So that's our tangent line, and that line can be used uh, to approximate the, uh, our function at x's that are near 4, right? that are near 4, near this value. So if you want to approximate the square root of 4 plus 1, so that's our function at 4 plus 1. Okay. That's going to be approximately what the line tells us. So 1 fourth times 4.1. Uh, maybe I should do this graphically, right? So the idea is when you plug in a certain value of x into the equation of a line, you should get something that's uh, 
close in y value to the, um, the function at x. Okay, so that's going to be uh, 1 plus 0 0.025 plus 1. So 2.025. So uh, apparently, square root of 4.1 is approximately 2.025. And if somebody can check how close that is, that would be great. Um, but that's what you're going to be. That's one thing that derivatives are used for. And for the, uh, since we're kind of short on time, I'll go ahead and move on. And look at another application of derivatives. Uh, okay. So we're going to go through the mechanics of computing this derivative. Uh, so here our function is 1 over x squared plus 1. Okay. And we want to find the slope of the function at an arbitrary x value. Right? So we want a general formula for all the slopes. So it's pretty good? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so 2 point. Yeah, 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 so it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and I know that that approximation in the previous example is really simple, so, uh, but the spirit of it is uh, what counts, right? Okay, so uh, we're going to find this derivative using the difference quotient, except since I'm evaluating, finding the derivative of an arbitrary x, I'll just say to x, let's add some change in x to get it to a new point on the x-axis, x plus h, and plug that in. And uh, we have two points on the graph of our function. We can define a line and its slope. So the slope of the secant line would be the change in the values of y divided by the change in the values of the x. And then we're going to take a limit as that change goes to 0. All right. I think I could do this in two minutes, right? Oops. So here, uh, we're just, uh, for the function at x plus h, uh, that's like the new x, right? So any place you see x in the original definition of f of x, you would just replace it with a new argument, x plus h then minus the function at x divided by change in x. All right, and here we, uh, since we have uh, fractions within fractions, we just do the, uh, I guess, natural thing and just combine the two fractions by finding a common denominator. So I'll just use the uh, kind of flying uh, x method, right? I don't know what to call it. Uh, a common denominator is always just the product of the denominators involved. So we're going to get x squared plus 1 minus x plus h squared minus 1 over h. So I did uh, some algebra here at full speed. So if I'm speeding, I apologize but I guarantee it's not illegal, right? So you would just have to, again, foil the numerator. And hopefully everything goes right. We have nice cancellations. In the numerator, all the terms that don't have an uh, H in them will cancel, as you notice. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we have x squared minus x squared, and then we have 1 minus 1. So that's the kind of nice algebra you expect to happen when you're using limits to find a derivative. 
and you're left with uh, the two terms, both of which have an H as a factor, so we can factor that out. And that conveniently will cancel the H in the denominator. Okay, so after that cancellation, we try to reevaluate the limit directly, and that'll work out, right? H is going to zero, X is fixed, so we're gonna get minus two X because H went to zero h goes to zero and on the bottom we're going to get uh, x squared plus one from here times itself so that's just x squared plus one squared okay so that's another derivative of a more complicated function but i wanted to relate it to see what it tells us about uh where's my graph So this is another application of derivatives because it, the derivative will tell us something about the function, right? As well as well as like higher order derivatives. So you can take the derivative of this to get the second derivative and so on. But derivatives tells us tell us something about the function, and it should be intuitive here. Uh, so if you take an x that's positive and you try to attempt to you know sketch a tangent line would you say that that slope of the tangent line is negative or positive right it has a negative slope this tangent line does and so that should be reflected by the derivative of a function at x there being negative and indeed it is Notice the numerator is squared. I'm sorry, the denominator is squared. So that's always positive. Uh, I did something wrong. Oh my gosh. Uh, I did something. I think you're good because you chose a positive x, right? Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, when things are binary like that, sometimes it's uh, more difficult than it's not. All right. Um, yeah, so it's a, a negative slope. So uh, the, the denominator is positive. The numerator is going to be negative because x is positive, right? So positive times negative. So the fact that the slope of the tangent line is negative is reflected in the formula as it should be. But it also tells us something about the function, right? So at this uh, value of x in orange, we see that as x is increasing, uh, the value of the function is decreasing, right? So we say that's a decreasing function, and that's reflected in the fact that the slope of the function, so to speak, the, technically the slope of the tangent line, is negative. So that's going to be uh, very important application uh, so if you take a point and you look at the t uh, slope of the tangent line so the derivative if the slope is positive that's going to indicate that the function is increasing as x increases right okay and in fact that gives us uh, another important application so if like to the left of the origin here the slopes are positive but to the left, the slopes are negative. Right at the peak, if things are well behaved, we should get a slope that's zero. Like we should get a tangent line that's also a horizontal line, a horizontal tangent. Okay. Uh, so I'll quickly just do an application of that. So uh, here we have a parabola, uh, so and it's opening upwards. And we have pre-calculus ways of finding this vertex of the parabola. But we can use calculus. We can use derivatives because we note that uh, at the very at the vertex, if you were to imagine a tangent line, it would be a horizontal. Yeah, it has slope zero. So if you want to find the vertex of maybe not a parabola, but more complicated objects, like uh, 
you could uh, use derivative. So here uh, we would find the derivative of the function at some arbitrary x. And I'll use this formulation. So it's the function at x plus h. And then minus the function at x, which, uh, yeah. And I think it's 3 o'clock, so you guys are free to leave. I'm just going to go ahead and finish this for the purposes of the video. So uh, if you need to go, there is a survey that's linked in the chat that you might want to fill out. Uh, I'll go ahead and just take my time with this one since it's for the video. Okay. So that's uh, our starting formula, the limit of the difference quotient to get the slope of the tangent line. And then here, any place we see x, uh, we're going to replace it with x plus h. We still have a constant. And then minus the function at x divided by the change in x. So there's nothing really left to do here except to um, multiply stuff out and hopefully get cancellations, FOIL, distribute, distribute. And let's see what cancels. Again, as advertised, <clears throat> all the terms that don't have a H in them will cancel. leaving us with terms in the numerator that all have an H in them. So we can factor out an H. Okay, H is canceled. Now we can evaluate the limit and we get as H goes to zero, we're left with two X minus H. Okay, so that gives you a formula in terms of X for the, the slope of your function, the slope of the tangent lines. And we are interested in the vertex of our parabola, so that's where the slope would be zero. So we take that derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve for x. Where obviously x would be three. So our vertex would have an x-coordinate of three, and the y-coordinate would be, well, whatever the parabola, the, well, the function at three is. Anyway, thank you. Sorry for uh, going over time. And good luck. We'll see you in the uh, tutoring lab in the basement of the library. Come and visit. You can drop in and have. Uh, when are we open, Elliot? Do you know? I forget. It's not the first week of classes. This is the second week. Uh, we're open, yeah, in the second week. So that'll be Monday the 29th. Yeah. Uh, the YouTube. Uh, well, let me get the the, uh, yeah. the link to the YouTube. Uh, you can always just Google UTD peer tutoring and YouTube uh, or search in YouTube.